Welcome back to another episode of The Creative Minority. Today, we are joined by Murtaza Hussein, who is a reporter at The Intercept, who focuses on national security and foreign policy. Um, he has he has an excellent number of articles which he's written, which has appeared on The Intercept and on places such as CNN, BBC, MSNBC, and other news outlets. And he is one of my favorite fo uh, follows on Twitter as well with his political commentary and sometimes with his memes. Thank you for joining us, Mortaza. Well, thank you for having me. So today we'd like to discuss the topic of the rise of China um, and looking at this from a number of different angles, looking at uh, the rise of China as a, as a national entity, looking at the emergence of this Cold War now between the USA and China, um, and conclude with talking about where does the Muslim world stand in relation with China and U.S. in the emergence of this of, of the Second Cold War? And I felt it was uh, it, it, I felt the perfect quote which would uh, begin this topic was a quote from the, the great French military leader Napoleon, who said that "Let China sleep, for when it wakes up, she will wake she will rule the world." And mm. You know, I think that's kind of self-explanatory, but for somebody like Napoleon to kind of see it um, in an age prior to, you know, the almost economic domination of China, which is solely, uh, which is solely emerging, is something which is quite extraordinary. But um, uh, I'll leave it there for you, Murtaza. Sure. You know, it's interesting, like uh, it, the period in which China was suppressed for, you know, several centuries in China, they call particular period of Western domination, the century of humiliation, it's really an aberration if you think about it in the long term of history, that China has always been a very large, uh, advanced economically, technologically, culturally, politically power, far more so than Europe was before the Enlightenment and uh, the period which Napoleon is referring to. So, you know, in some sense, he was predicting the future, but also he was drawing an analogy with the past, which is that China, it's really the norm that China should be very powerful. Uh, India should be very powerful, and Europe's uh, period of domination uh, it's really something which is not common in history. It's not something which is uh, the norm as it's been in history. Uh, it's something which is very aberrant uh, indeed. So, you know, China, it's kind of re returning in some sense to its natural position as hmm. a demographic, political, economic heavyweight in the world. What happens in the future, it's hard to see, but you know, at the moment, you can see that China has become very, very, very integral and important to the international system. And something that even at that time, I think Napoleon could see because China has a large landmass, strong culture, large demographic base. When some leader can come along to galvanize that effectively, eventually it's going to become something if that, uh, that happens. And I think it's actually not that different from the Muslim world in some sense too, because you know, right now the Muslim world's very chaotic, you know, poor, divided and china was like that you know not that long ago china was like afghanistan you know some not, not that long ago within the, some historical memory and but you know you, you'd see that if this could be fixed if this could be ameliorated there could be a lot of power here and something to be you know concerned about or something to manage and so forth so i think that you know even the weakest china's been uh, the potentiality mm -hmm. for being a superpower has all been there Hmm. And I think, you know, this is kind of like, I think this is a, for us who have only experienced, who have only <clears throat> lived in a world dominated uh, by the West, um, you know, there's this narrative that begins to uh, envelop that the West has been, you know, historically this, uh, this global power. But when you really read history, you really find that the, in the, for the vast majority of history, the world was largely run by Asia in terms of its economics and its political and military ambitions. Exactly right. Exactly right. If you look at the charts of global GDP, uh, Europe was really quite low for a very, very long time until industrialization, modernity, which they had the first crack at. And then you saw them take off uh, exponentially. And, you know, we've lived in the world for at least a few centuries where Europe and the West have been dominant. And it's shaped the modern world in very, very mm -hmm. profound and lasting and deep ways. But I don't think that you necessarily can see a world where Europe is always the most powerful and the United States is always the most powerful. It, you may, you may see, I think the United States has a lot better shot at staying influential and powerful mm -hmm. for a long time than perhaps Europe does. The U.S. is a bit different. Uh, but, you know, the West generally, 
there's no reason that the West should be more powerful than the collective, or it should be the most important part of the world as opposed to Asia. Most people in the world live in Asia. Uh, it's traditionally that Asian, Eurasian landmass control of it has determined uh, the balance of power in the world as you know other powers in the past have recognized. So, you know, it's something that people say the rise of the Asian century, and I think we are going to see that. But I don't think that that is something necessarily new in history. If you look at history in the broad scope, it's a return to norm. It's logical. And it's something that uh, I think we're going to expect to see most likely in the lifetimes of people who are young today. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's interesting, like there's always this hundred year period where they are like almost like these empires or civilizations that they have their time. And so um, I believe there was this one uh, academic who said that the 19th century saw um, uh, the 19th century saw the Europeanization of the world and the 20th century saw the Americanization of the world. And now the 21st century is beginning to see the Asianization of the world. Oh, and it, it, it's, it's a very interesting, uh, it's a very interesting, um, uh, not a theory, but it's a very interesting way at, at looking at, at civilizations, how they kind of have like almost usually this hundred year period where they're conquering the world. And then it just shifts to this next power into this next power. You know, it's interesting. I heard a quote once that uh, a European uh, diplomat observed that Today, modernity starts in Asia and flows west from there, as opposed mm. to historically when modernity's flown, flowed from the west to the rest of the world. And, you know, I think that a couple of years ago, I remember I was in Kuala Lumpur and I was traveling around Southeast Asia. And, you know, I was just kind of taking in the vibe. And I noticed that people are very excited. They're very proud of, you know, modernity. They're very proud of their buildings and their trains and their commercial life and so forth. It's a lot of upbeat energy. and you can see the people who, you know, they put a lot of pride into mm. everything they do, the buildings and so forth. Whereas I think people are a little tired of modernity here. They're a little uh, jaded and cynical. They've had it for a while. It's not novel anymore. They don't put a lot of effort. I'll give you one example. Like if you go to like a mall in North America, for the most part, it's kind of pretty dead vibe. I think like most of them are <laughs> pretty empty. It's kind of become a meme now that malls are dying all over in the United States. It's not something, it's something that people are tired of, clearly. Uh, you know what's Malaysia and Singapore you go to the mall it's like they put a lot of cultural energy into the mall oh, no. but it's really different exciting beautiful something very very surprising to be honest and I'm not the type of person to go shopping and stuff like that very often but just to hang out there and just seeing how people interact with it it's a lot of energy there's a lot of energy there a lot of new things they make things very beautiful and I think that I got the sense from that traveling around uh, during those times that you know, there is a sense that modernity is more vivid and alive here. I always hated modern architecture. I didn't like it because I was associated with, you know, generic glass cubes, things like that, like not very historical or aesthetic. It changed my mind. Go to Asia, go to even like Dubai and places like that. You'll see that there is like a more energetic modernity there, just in aesthetic and cultural expression. And I think that this is going to go a lot deeper too, because we have a, very, very importantly, we have demographic shifts which favor, favor Asia. A lot more energy is going to be there, uh, it seems, in the years to come. So, you know, I don't, uh, I do foresee that a lot of the central center of ec cultural, economic, political gravity is going to shift there and shifting there very, very fast, as many people have mm -hmm. already noticed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's and interesting, you, know, you mentioned this idea of, uh, of architecture. Um, and, you know, when you, the more, I, I mean, I just, I just recently came back from Turkey um, and, you know, Turkey is, I think, one of the most beautiful countries in the world, especially in the realm of its architecture. But, you know, many people talk about Turkey's um, inflation and how the currency is in crisis and so forth. But, you know, when I visited Turkey, I realized like Turkey is the furthest thing from a poor country. Like some people really think Turkey is like, a second or third world country. But when you go to Turkey, you see not only do they have uh, the largest airport in the world, but they just they recently built a new mosque, uh, the Jami Masjid, and they spent more than a billion dollars on it. And, you know, it, it made me really realize that like Turkey and Istan Istanbul specific is kind of like at the center of the world. It's kind of like at the, at the meeting places where a lot of things happen, but that Turkey, despite its economic crisis, I think is still a country which is poised in the future uh, to expand its influence. Well, I completely agree. The first time, you know, when you arrive in Istanbul, the first time there, you do really feel like the center of the world. 
Mm -hmm. uh, it's the gateway between so right in the crux of Europe and Asia. Uh, the way the Bosporus is, the grand architecture, as you said, ancient architecture and modern architecture, feels like New York. It feels like, you know, feel, it was like Rome. It was the second Rome, like literally, and it still, it still is and has that identity. So, you know, it's interesting. Like, I, I do believe that in the long term, there's a very talented, energetic population mm -hmm. that in Turkey. There's a lot of historic, cultural capital to draw upon, uh, a lot of resources, many educated people. I think that they have a lot of challenges today in the sense of, uh, you know, some of the infrastructure projects or the use of resources or you can even say corruption in some sense is uh, it's quite acute today. But, you know, I think I look in the long term, I think the long term Turkey is obviously going to be a very important country and it already is very important. And mm -hmm. yeah, it's by no means really a second world, a third world country. It's really first world country, but a different kind of first world country, a first world country, which is still sort of has all the dangers and uh, possibilities that the United States maybe had 50 years ago before we kind of settled into a new normal. So the future is very much up in the air. And I don't know what's going to happen in the short term. There could be more difficulties in the short term as possible. But I do believe that barring some calamity in the long term, it's going to be a very important country. It's going to be a very important country uh, culturally, politically, technologically, economically, all that, because it's very strategically positioned. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Inflation is very tough. Inflation is absolutely catastrophic for the average person there. But, you know, it's interesting, like inflation is very good for businessmen and you know, people who are yeah. in business and so forth. So it's a terrible time to be a consumer in Turkey, but it's a good time to be a businessman. So, you know, most people, I guess, are consumers, but mm -hmm. it's interesting. It's not a, it's a very interesting country. It's a very, there's a lot of potential and possibility. What's going to happen right now? I don't know. What's going to happen politics there? I don't know. It's a very big, Mm -hmm. Some very big questions coming up, but in the long term, let's look at the things in the long term here. I think the trends do favor a very strong and uh, influential Turkey in the years to come. In Turkey is, I think, uh, one of the many countries uh, in Asia which are rising, and you know there. And, and, and I know the discussion of this podcast is on the future of China. I mean, the, the rise of China, but I think. You know, Parag Khanna, uh, he wrote an excellent book on this. And I think the title of the book really encapsulates the subject, which he titled The Future is Asian. Mm. And he makes it very clear in the book. He says, I <coughs> intentionally named the book The Future is Asian and not The Future is China. Mm. Because although China is supposed to be, you know, by many estimates, by 2050, uh, to have the highest GDP in the world, um, there are many other countries um, in Asia which are also significantly on the rise. And, you know, one of the countries I really I was really shocked to find out about this, but they say by 2050 um, and this is from multiple uh, from multiple institutions, they've stated that when it comes to the top five GDPs in the world, they've said that number one is China, which I was which I could understand. Mm. Number two, they said was India, which to a certain extent, it was a shock, but I could still understand, right? India has oh. a has a massive population. Um, there's a lot of infrastructure development. Bangalore now is becoming, you know, here in a, in a, in, a, in a Silicon Valley, um, many people are actually moving to Bangalore um, oh. Oh. instead, instead because they're oh. realizing this th th this is the future. Um, oh. And then thirdly, they put the U.S. and then fourth or fifth, I can't remember uh, uh, which one it was, but they actually put Indonesia. As a fourth yeah. or fifth highest GDP right. by 2050, and although there was a it was, there was a large difference between Indonesia and the U.S., the fact that Indonesia was on that list, you know, an Asian country which nobody really talks about, um, you know, it was quite startling, and it made me realize that aside from <laughs> countries like China, um, aside from countries like Vietnam, um, India, you know, Indonesia, a Muslim country, is actually cracking the top five. Indonesia is a great economic success story, like very quietly. We don't talk about it a lot here uh, in the United States. It's far away. It's not really in the crux of uh, political conflicts in the U.S., but a great economic success story, uh, you know, high growing uh, per capita GDP every year. A lot of people being lifted out of poverty every year. A lot of potential in Indonesia, you know, a lot of tech, a lot of things going on there. And a huge population, like the biggest Muslim country in the world, actually by population, and not even close, it's far, far, far greater. So, you know, it's interesting. It's a, it's a country which is going to be very important in the years to come. They have a lot of challenges with climate change, and this mm -hmm. is a problem throughout Southeast Asia. 
Uh, but, you know, what I'll say about climate change is that, you know, the best way in the short term to deal with climate change, like decarbonization is important in the long term and needs to happen and the steps taking the, for it to happen today. But I think in the short term, the best way to insulate yourself from impacts of climate change is to gain resources, to become rich as possible, to build infrastructure. Uh, because as we've seen, countries which are rich or countries which have resources they can deploy, uh, they're able to build the infrastructure, dams, walls, things like that, to prevent the cat catastrophe of climate change. So Indonesia, you know, it has its challenge, but it has a very fast growing economy. So I'm quite confident that they'll be able to manage it in a way which allows them to continue growing, as opposed to, for instance, Pakistan, which, uh, as you saw, you know, Pakistan, they had a very poor country for most people, uh, it had this impact of climate change, uh, very, very acute. And they've been devastating economically and devastating to the social fabric. And I don't think that Indonesia is going to face that. I think that, you know, hopefully they're going to keep growing, they keep developing, and they're going to be protect, able to protect themselves. So, you know, I, I did notice that Indonesia was on that same list of top GDPs in the future. And, you know, I was very happy. I was very glad to hear that. It's a country which, you know, a lot of potential, a lot of uh, history, and it should play a very important role in the years to come. And I'm very curious what kind of role relationship it has with the U.S. vis-a-vis -vis balancing the U.S., uh, as a distant partner, and then also China as an immediate reality. Hmm. And I'm glad you brought up the topic of climate change because um, Parag Khan has actually, he mentions it in the, in the book, The Future is Asian, but also in his previous book, he talks about how the one thing that can really destroy all of these predictions, one of the, one of the many things is climate change. And it's interesting you mentioned Indonesia and Indonesia. Well, one of one of the theories that he mentions, which is obviously not his theory, but it's a theory he's adopted, which is this idea that with sea levels rising, um, all of the port cities um, are going to become flooded if things stay the way they are. And that what that's going to do, do it's, is it's going to force us to move inwards. But the problem that he poses is that globally, the vast majority of the world's population lives on the seas. And mm. so Indonesia, I, I have many Indonesian friends. They, they tell me one of the things we really struggle with is with the rising of, uh, uh, of the sea levels. Um, Jakarta, for instance, is, is going to be flooded. And I just actually read a couple of days ago that Indonesia is actually creating a new capital city away right. from the sea and into the land. And so now, you know, what we're witnessing in Pakistan is, I think, you know, a clear indication of what happens when climate, ch climate change begins to worsen and when a country has poor infrastructure, that something like a third of the, uh, a third of the country can be engulfed in a flood. And uh, I think this was one of the things that Imran Khan was really trying to target against. Yeah, absolutely. Look, uh, you know, you're right, Indonesia is building a new capital city to, to move Jakarta or to move away from Jakarta. It's not the only country doing that. There are a lot of people, planned cities are becoming a big thing because of this. There's a concept called managed retreat. Managed retreat is, you know, because as you mentioned, most people in the world live on coastlines. Uh, it's better to move back from those coastlines if they're going to flood. They do it in a way which is planned, do it in a way which, you know, has places people can move to, as opposed to doing it chaotically, just being forced out by, uh, you know, floods and typhoons and hurricanes and things like that. And, you know, Indonesia is going to build a city. And is it going to be inequality in that's how it's distributed the resources? I would probably think so, given how most of these elite-driven products uh, projects work out. Are people going to be left, left behind? Probably. Are they going to have continuity of government and mm -hmm. things like that? Yeah, probably because they're planning for it. In Pakistan, there's no plan, actually. There's, I don't see there's not any investment in this. There's a lot of reliance on very meager international aid to patch up some of the worst. So in Pakistan, there's, I think the estimated damages so far from the floods is like $10, $15 billion, perhaps more than that. Uh, they recently got an IMF bailout of $1.17 billion, which is really not much at all. Uh, that was before the floods. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Imran Khan did bring up climate change quite a bit in terms of, uh, you know, messaging the fact that Pakistan is a frontline state for climate change. Most glaciers in the world outside the Arctic are in Pakistan. Mm -hmm. uh, it is a lot of uh, the agricultural country relies very much on uh, those glaciers to feed the waters in the Indus as monsoon, things like that. But I think actually in the case of Pakistan, that the climate stress is putting stress on a system which is already corrupt and uh, very, very insufficient to deal with 
any challenges. There's no infrastructure anyways sufficient. So if you have no infrastructure at all and no plans for it, and you have these stresses, you know, you're going to deal, you're going to have a very, very difficult time dealing with that. So I think the really the issue in Pakistan was not so much, the climate is an issue, but the uh, issue mainly is the political system and the economic system is dysfunctional. It's not, there's a lot of potential there. It's not galvanized in a way in which resources can be used to mitigate the impact of climate change to build infrastructure. So hopefully in Indonesia, we can do that. And, you know, the growth of Indonesian economy suggests that there is some potential there. So it's living for Bangladesh too. Bangladesh is very mm. threatened by climate change, but they're getting rich. They have a higher per capita GDP than India now. They have the highest per capita GDP in South Asia. Mm. So there's a lot more hope that they can, you know, build. Uh, you know, I, I read recently that, uh, you know, the Netherlands with Dutch, they have a very advanced uh, history of learning how to deal with the uh, flooding and like how to deal with like, you know, managing coastlines and so forth helping the Bengalis actually develop their own coastline mm-hmm. in a similar manner. <clears throat> so that's a forward-looking projects, engaging with the international community. You know, Pakistan, unfortunately, economic problems, corruption, um, you know, political problems. It's also very bad relations with the rest of the world. There's very ill relations with the rest of the world for a lot of reasons. Mm-hmm. So it's harder to draw on that goodwill or draw on those connections and uh, you know, have a constructive relationship with the rest of the world. It's, it's very t- challenging. I think the Pakistan will keep stumbling along because it's the fifth biggest country in the world by population, uh, has nuclear weapons, all those things. But, you know, I don't know. It's not going to be, you know, a lot of the Asia is getting rich. Asia is getting rich. And Pakistan could be one of the richest countries in Asia. I'm not kidding, but it's just not going to be mm-hmm. in the short term, it looks like. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, still, when, when they look at these uh, these predictions that they have for 2060 and 2060 and so forth, they do put, like, you, you do see the rise of many well, i mean you do see the rise of asian countries but pakistan also with many other um countries such as egypt and so forth turkey iran they're all, they all they're also raised as well but um the reason why i think this topic is so pertinent and why i think it's so important not only just simply as an observation as to what's going on as to have an idea of seeing the rise of china um beginning to see you know this cold war which you know we will get into but uh, Parag Khanna wrote another excellent book, um, which, which is his newest book titled Move. Mm. And he, the central thesis in his argument, and it was really kind of, um, it was really a message towards um, the younger generation. Mm. And what he was essentially stating is, with all of the changes happening in the world, in the global world order, with the rise of Asian countries, um, with the decline of certain European countries, um, with the global, with the threat of climate change and the warming of the world, and then certain, and now certain places becoming more inhabitable, such as maybe northern Canada or Russia um, or Netherlands and so forth, he proposes this this uh, this argument that that our generation should be ready to move wherever they need to go, uh-huh. and that whatever skills that they have, these skills should be mobile, mm. because. Um, with all these new options coming out and with how fragile things are becoming, you should always be, you should always have a backup plan mm-hmm. or, 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 or aside from that, you should always have a, you, sh- you should be looking at a place now, which you think looks to be more suitable, which, which appears to be more safe and move to it. And one of the, one of the interesting places that he mentions actually, um, as a possible destination for some people is the new city in Saudi Arabia, Neon. Oh, really? Yeah. And so he, he mentions how much money they're allocating towards people from the West um, uh, and the lifestyle and how and how, you know, they're trying. You know, he really gives a, a, a good explanation as to what's happening there. But he explains how, you know, other places such as UAE and so forth um, are also good destinations. But then he also proposes um, areas which, according to the science that he adopts, will become inhabitable. And he argues that much of the places in the middle east much of the places uh in africa which are at which are the hottest temperatures in the world um will actually be inhabitable um and so he's it's really kind of just like a wake-up call to people to just really think about what the future holds for them you know it's interesting i was i've been very interested in climate change for a long time and uh one thing i've actually it's interesting like i always thought that okay everywhere is hot it's going to be completely you know, uninhabitable, be parched, and things like that. It's true, but it's a little bit more complicated in a way. Like what the heating of the climate does, basically, 
to areas which are very humid today and wet, they precipitate more. So they get more wet, basically. In areas which are very dry heat, they get really dry. So, you know, we saw in Pakistan, like, you know, very strong monsoons, like a lot of humidity mm-hmm. in Pakistan. So you're going to see more precipitation, more water. And if you have a good way of managing that, then you can capitalize on it. You don't have to let short the country. You can utilize water resources in a way which is constructive. Is that what's difficult, as you kind of alluded to, is countries which are dry heat, like the Middle East, mm-hmm. a lot of it and so forth. Uh, it's not that type of heat moist humid climate it's very very dry uh and they're gonna burn up a lot <clears throat> it's I, you know i don't want to say that x number of countries is just going to be uninhabitable because what about the million people who live there what i'm going to tell all those people um i don't know and you know i'm always surprised at ingenuity and developing water resources and things like that uh people will find ways of adapting it's been you can change the architecture you can change the built environment you can adapt a lot. But what I would say is that, you know, for the necessary adaption to happen, you need to have stable, uh, responsible, competent, forward-looking political authorities uh, that can deal very adeptly with a very acute, unprecedented challenge, which is the heating of the environment. So I don't know. Uh, I'm not totally determined about this, about what's going to happen or not. There's been a lot of doomsday scenarios in the past, mm-hmm. which we got, we adapted away from. It's not that they didn't happen. We just uh, successfully steered ourselves away from. Uh, the ozone layer was a big thing for a long time. But, you know, I think that it is a big challenge. It's real. It's a big challenge. It's going to be a huge challenge for uh, Middle Eastern states. I was in Iraq just before the pandemic, and it was so hot. It was unbelievably hot. Like, you could not even walk around outside in the day. It was that hot. So I wonder how are people going to live like this? And I would say, though, you know, a lot of the heat and the unbearableness of it, uh, it hits you when you're, you know, going about your day, when you're driving, when you're walking around on the streets, which are not very hospitable. There's some places with traditional architecture, with covered streets and things like that. It's a lot more bearable. It's a lot, mm-hmm. you know, I can, I can imagine living during, doing stuff during the day in those situations. What's difficult is agricultural labor, mm-hmm. construction labor. That's mm-hmm. very, very hard. It's been like that for a long time. It's been very, very hard for a long time, even in a lot of Pakistan, too, and other places, India. So I don't know. It's going to be tough. Um, You know, one thing that happens historically is that, you know, you go through calamities and then horrible things happen, but then the world just keeps growing. And despite that, continuing and people, a a billion different small adaptations happen on individual levels and somehow the world keeps going. So, yeah, I don't know. I think that, you know, Dubai, you can live in Dubai because it's air-conditioned. You can live mm-hmm. in Qatar because it's air-conditioned. So if more places got rich, more places got rich enough that they could build infrastructure like that, you know, maybe you can live. I don't know. But mm-hmm. if we're, people are poor and there's no infrastructure, there's no good government, and they're dealing with this, it's going to be a very, very ugly situation. Mm-hmm. And I think that's, although that's a global problem, um, I mean, you know, last year I was in Vancouver and uh, it was the, it was recorded as the hottest uh, hottest year in Canadian history, um, yeah. and now I'm in San Francisco, and la- and just this week was actually the hottest day in the Bay Area history. Wow. Um, there's there, there's clearly something going on here, right? Uh, but despite that, you know, I think the effects uh, that are uh, of climate change that are happening on you know Asia in in many of these poor countries like Pakistan and so forth. Um, are are disastrous and are things like you know the the idea that a third of a country can be destroyed by a flood is insane like a third you know earthquakes usually take up you know you know i mean i live here in the bay we have earthquakes like every week um you know it's just like you know it's a it's a minor thing or even when it's big it's just in a small area but the fact that an entire third of a country could be flooded just really shows you how disastrous in the long term these things can be not only, you know, to the world, but to, you know, the, the development of Asia. Totally, totally. It's a huge variable. It's a huge variable. You know, climate change could be a lot worse than people are predicting. It could be, you know, we have predictions, we have models. Uh, they could be, it could be not as bad. It could be a lot worse. We don't know. And I think it's a huge variable. That's why I was these futurism books. I mean, mm-hmm. I really like them because it made mm-hmm. me think of the future creatively and they kind of get you out of your head in the present day but i will stick them with just this huge caveat which is that no one knows no one knows particularly the internet 
35 years ago or 40 years ago. Like no one thought that this thing was going to happen. It would change everything. Uh, so who knows what's going to happen? Maybe there'll be a technological advancement which uh, solves this issue. I'm not, I don't think it's going to be silver bullet like that, but let's say there, there could be. Uh, maybe climate change is a lot worse. Maybe it's a lot better. Maybe something happens with the earth that they, there's some ad adaptation takes place that people are able to deal with it. I don't know. But I do think this is a huge variable and uh, it's a very like practical thing. Like it was 125 degrees Fahrenheit in India, you know, not that long ago. Like that's how hot it was in India. How's India going to be a superpower when it's that mm -hmm. hot? The crops are being burnt up. People can't mm -hmm. function, do labor on a day-to-day -day basis. All the other strengths and power India has to be constrained by that. Pakistan, we've already discussed. So, you know, I don't know. I, I really don't know. But, uh, mm -hmm. you know, some things we can talk about more, are like you know, with certainty are political shifts, demographic shifts, things like that. Uh, the climate is something which, Personally, I think we'll find a way to deal with, but I can't say that with uh, with total confidence. Mm -hmm. But what I do think we can say is that from the evidence that has been uh, that has been presented to us, it does seem very clear that despite you know these natural disasters, despite climate change, uh, Asia is definitely the the twenty first century is the Asian century. And mm -hmm. one of the things that I found very startling was when I looked at the GDP of uh, many of the European countries. Mm -hmm. uh, when I looked at France, Germany, uh, the United Kingdom, the Dutch, one of the things which was so fascinating is that almost all of them um, have not seen an increase in their GDP in, really in, in, oh. the, in the last 20 or so years. And it, it was quite startling. But when you look at the U.S., the U.S. still is on that trajectory. And like you mentioned earlier on, there's no doubt the U.S. will be a superpower even in the future. But like, but then when you look at the GDP of the rest of the world, in many of the, you know, you look at Ethiopia, India, uh, Indonesia, Vietnam, all these different countries, you see that there has been this rise. And like, mm. the wake up call for me was like, what happened in Europe? Right. Well, you know, it's interesting. Like, uh, I think that a lot of the determinant of uh, economic growth, we don't tend to think of it this way, but it's true is demographically based. Mm. So, you know, young people, they work a lot more, they make a lot more money, they spend a lot more, they drive the economy, they have more life events, which necessitate large amounts of spending. Uh, so a younger, the younger a country is, the more its economy tends to grow, the more dynamism there is in the economy. Now, Europe, it's gone, it's one of the most modern place in the world. They experience modernity first in many ways. It's very, very urbanized. It's very, very, it's been like that for a very long time. They're used to that kind of lifestyle. And one of the correlations of modernity and urbanization is to having less kids. Because mm -hmm. when you're in a very rural situation, rural environment, kids are an asset. You want to have more kids because they do more work. Uh, it's economically beneficial to you. Culturally, you tend to be more inclined to do so in such circumstances as well, too. Uh, when you live in a city, you have less kids, every kid is more like work, or actually is more economically a burden, so you can't afford to have as many even if you wanted to. So, you know, there's a completely different dynamic there. Now, what you see now is the Europeans haven't been having a lot of kids for a very long time. If you look at the age uh, charts of Europe, it's like heavily weighted, like 40s, 50s, 60s, above. Kids, like next generation is gonna be very, very few. Mm -hmm. So. You know, that means necessarily, necessarily, it means it means slower growth, it means stagnation. And the U.S. has a bit of this, too. There's the U.S. aging society, the below replacement birth rate. But the U.S. has, honestly, it sounds like so basic, but they have a superpower, which is immigration. Uh, mm. They have very, mm. very strong, it's a country of immigrants, it's actually true. And they bring people from all over the world, and they come here, they raise families, kids, they very talented people in many cases uh they work here and they build the country they build the gdp with the virtue of that so the u.s doesn't run out of people doesn't run out of young people it can bring young people in and for abroad mm -hmm. it has that system set up europe has some immigration but you know they're not as comfortable with immigration for cultural historic reasons they don't uh, want that as much they don't have a system set up they're not they're not countries of immigrants they're not, mm -hmm. they don't have traditions of immigration they're european countries are like middle eastern countries they're tied to a specific identity or specific you know culture they want to maintain that's like how their mentality is most countries in the world are like that to be honest with you china and japan are like that too mm -hmm. the u.s is very different the u.s and canada 
almost alone in Australia, like Anglo countries, uh, pro-immigration uh, historically it could change, but that's what they've been like. Uh, and that's a very, it's been what's given them power. If the U.S. did not have immigration, in, it would have died as a superpower in the 20th mm -hmm. century because it wouldn't have all these Jews and Italians and Germans and people who came and built it up. If it was just an Anglo country, Anglo, Anglo colony, it would have been over a long time ago. It would have been a very unimportant country for the most part. <clears throat> after, because after it urbanized, it would have stopped growing. But, you know, Europe unfortunately has this issue. And, you know, honestly, I will say surprisingly, it's not just Europe. China, even lower birth rate. You know, if official stats. That's why I'm a bit skeptical of this narrative of China being the next superpower mm -hmm. dominating the world. Because if you look at the demographics, current charts indicate that China's population could decrease by so like 400-something million by the end of the century from mm -hmm. 1.2 billion it could, if it stays on its trajectory. What happened was that during communism, during, sorry, uh, it's not communism, but during a peak of the communist repression, at least of the majority population, one child policy was instituted. And, you know, you can have one kid, every family. That seemed like a logical, if extreme response to what they feared at the time was overpopulation. Okay, it was very effective. They got the birth rate down. Once you get birth rates down, it's very hard to get them back up. Because, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, people get used to a new style of living. They get used to, they adapt to that. Now they're desperately trying, they raise the one child limit, two child limit. Now they're saying three child limit. Now they're going to take it off entirely, probably. Nothing's changing. Nothing's helping. They can't uh, fix this issue. And China is not a society of immigrants. They're not going to let people from Pakistan or Sudan or anywhere else start immigrating to China and work living there and becoming mm -hmm. citizens of China. It's not going to happen in a million years. So you're going to see decline. Japan is sort of an example. It's still, still a very old society. Korea, lowest birth rate in the world. Not very bullish on their future for this reason. And you see Japan, if you look at writings from the 80s and the early 90s, the same thing people are saying about China is going mm -hmm. to take over the world. Yeah. They're saying about Japan. And Japan is going to dominate mm -hmm. the United States. It's going to be the world's biggest superpower. It didn't happen. Why didn't it happen? Because Japanese society got very old. Mm -hmm. Lots of dynamism. They have a huge problem socially internally but japan was able to survive these problems because by the time that they started manifesting they moved up the value chain in uh, the supply chains they started bring high quality goods you know value-added goods mm -hmm. china is still like technically the sweatshop of the world basically they do very low on, on the value chain they don't make high value goods in china they don't do value-added goods in china today for the most part uh, and, but at, it's also getting old. So it's getting old like Japan without that cushion to fall back on, that being higher on the chain. So I think it's going to be very tough. I think, think we'll see a lot of decline in China, to be honest with you. Uh, barring some technological advancement where babies are made in test tubes without procreation, which, you know, honestly, people do talk about it's possible, mm -hmm. which, but I don't see happening in a large scale anytime soon. Uh, it's going to have a very tough, a very tough future ahead of them. I think. And I don't think that, I'm not as bullish on China as I am on other Asian countries. Uh, I, I have more have more positivity about India actually than China in terms of who's going to mm. be determinative in Asian the future of Asia. But you know, they they have they can overcome. They're very smart people. They can overcome it. But you know, they mm. do have some serious problems and the same problems Europe has. Europe is going to face this future of decline because they cannot reverse this issue. Unless they totally change their culture to accommodate immigration on a large scale. Hmm. And, you know, you know, I, I intentionally didn't mention Japan for that reason. Because Japan is the fear that the world is watching of what happens when you let birth rates go out of control. And uh, I believe there was this article, I think it was on the New York Times maybe, or on the New Yorker, uh, which, was, which, was tr tr which was kind of like a wake-up call to Americans stating mm -hmm. that um, if we don't, you know, fix our birth rate... <sighs> will end up like Japan. And it just lists all of the problems that Japan has. Yeah. Um, and in the 80s and 90s, people thought Japan was actually going to compete with the US. Yeah. Um, it, its GDP was predicted uh, similar around the US, but uh, unfortunately it fell. But I, I do think, you know, one of the things, you know, that you, that you touched upon, which I think now we're really beginning to start to see the emergence of this. And I think really the, 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 the focal leaders of kind of like this movement uh, are people usually from the conservative side or maybe from the right or Elon Musk, but is the topic of population collapse and how population collapse really in European countries and in, you know, and some of the Asian countries, like you mentioned, is a real threat. And again, another thing which I found very startling, which actually 
I began to research after the New Zealand mosque shooting. Mm. Because when the new, new when the New Zealand mosque shooting happened, um, the shooters uh, the shooters manifesto was uploaded online, right. and I decided to read it and look at uh, uh, and look and look at what are the reasons that he believes uh, he needed to commit an atrocious act like this. And I remember in caps locks he wrote, um, "It's the birth rate." Yeah, yeah. And uh, after reading the whole thing, uh, I began to do some research on birth rates because he was, you know, he was espousing the whole replacement theory, the great replacement yeah, theory, yeah, and so yeah. forth. But again, what I found very startling was when I looked at every single European country, and including Canada and the U.S., um, every single one of these countries, with the exception of, of I believe, <laughs> Turkey. And I think maybe Bosnia. It may be mm. another country or two. Oh, I, I think Bosnia is also going down. But yeah, go, I think go ahead. Yeah, yeah Bosnia, I think, is... An, I know Turkey is just a little bit above it. But all these countries yeah. are under the yeah. uh, under the rate, with most of them, especially the more Western ones, um, being significantly lower. The U.S. is still a mm. little bit higher, but all of them are under the so-called, I think, 2.1 is the number, 2.1 mm. children um, uh, uh, per woman. And it's 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 really a wake up call. And so the interesting thing about this is many people argue with the whole refugee crisis um, is why do we have refugees coming in? Right. And my response largely is well, you need them to come in. Uh, right. For instance, right. you know, you know, we're both Canadians, uh, both Canadians living in the U.S. Um, right. People are always wondering why Canada is taking in so many refugees, so many Syrian refugees. Right. And the response is, is Canada has a small population. Only right. 40 million with all right. of that right. land, right. and they need a population increase. And so, right. without the refugees coming to many of these European countries, um, you know, the, uh, within 50, maybe 100 years, you would see a significantly a significant drop, and right. that would affect the economy. It would affect politics. It could give birth to you know these horrible politicians and so forth. And so, um, uh, if you don't want them coming into your country, well, the response would be is to maybe fix the birth rates just enough so that they stabilize right right you know this is the thing it's it's such a like a hard thing to talk about birth rates and things like that demographics because you know it's such a it seems so determinative it seems sort of like uh you know people don't talk about it in the news that much but actually it really is very important um mm -hmm. and you know what i'll say is that you know can you mentioned canada canada has a very healthy attitude towards immigration for the most mm -hmm. part because look they, they are, like, if you look at the world, like, it's not just Europe, by the way, like, Asia, Asian birth rates are also going down. When countries get rich, when they urbanize, kids mm -hmm. are having less kids because, you know, as I said earlier, urbanization necessitates less kids and incentivizes less kids. Also, cultural changes, like, women's empowerment to women. Mm -hmm. Anthropologists tend to look at birth rates <clears throat> when analyzing societies. Birth rates are used as an analogy for level of women's empowerment in society. Because when women have control of the production function, they tend to decide not to want to have kids the whole time, not only spend their whole life being pregnant. Mm -hmm. Totally understandable. So, you know, there's that. And I also read that guy's manifesto. I was very interested in it for you know, probably similar reasons. And yeah, that is a very big concern of him. So I think that this is a very, very important issue because this is, this is happening. It's going to happen that the world is changing demographically. Like that's something which, demographics, like we're talking about climate change is very unpredictable. Demographics are very predictable because you can look at the charts and you can just see how old people are today and how many kids are having today. And you can figure out what they're going to look like in the future with a pretty high degree of confidence. <clears throat> so this guy and like people like him who are, you know, similar views, maybe don't do as atrocious things, but they have, you hear this like term and these concerns of the people if you read the news and follow the discourse of these guys. You know, they have this concern of that they're, they are going to become a minority in the future in their countries. So I think that it's a very delicate situation. You have to talk about this in a constructive way. What I'll say is that, you know, you have a choice here. You can have no immigration in the country and you can have not just that you can get the poorer, you're going to see significant like breakdowns and collapses of anything you consider to be your standard of living. Like you don't mm -hmm. have enough labor to maintain the infrastructure. You don't have <clears throat> a tax base to pay for all the old people pay for their care when they're old and no care service providers for them either you're not going to have doctors you're not going to have people running the basic day-to-day -day thing of your life which the young people tend to do and if you don't have enough young people you're going to have a serious problem and automation is not going to solve this problem anytime soon it's not it's way way beyond anything automation can do 
in any foreseeable time frame. So you're looking at children of men type situation where society totally collapses. That's like really a reasonable outcome with no immigration. I think that could happen in China. I think China could break down mm. as, as a unitary state <clears throat> because of the population issue. That's really bad. Now, immigration, you can solve this problem. You can have people come in, they do the work, they build, they pay the taxes, they build society. But the correlation of that is you could have cultural changes. In society. Mm-hmm. That's the, the, basically the correlation. And as a Canadian, you know, someone from Vancouver, I'm from Toronto, I've seen in my lifetime, like there are changes, the cultural changes in the city of Toronto. Like I cannot, anyone with two eyes can see that. Like, you know, there are people, you go suburbs, everyone speaks Punjabi, everyone speaks Mandarin. It's like a significant change. And I've seen a change over my lifetime. So it's not, not real. But what I'll say is that, you know, given the choice between like just literally dying in society, just collapsing and keeling over, which is a no immigration situation, which is very, very predictable. And, you know, a diverse society where we navigate our differences with each other, work together, try to build a shared identity. You know, that could be, it seems like a lot more promising aspect. And people say, well, you know, it's not done. People don't mix people. You don't import, uh, you don't immigrate uh, people from Nigeria to Japan, or you don't immigrate people from Mexico to South Africa. It's just, it's not done. Well, you know, actually the most powerful empires in society history, they were polyglot. They were polyglot. Mm-hmm. They had, Rome had all different types of people. If you look at Islamic empires, you know, they had all different types of people. Mm-hmm. But the different types of people that they came, they're united by a shared public identity or civic identity. So mm-hmm. I think it's very important that, you know, we should identify as Canadians. We should identify as Americans. We should be proud of the good traditions and, you know, good aspects of the history of these places. And in doing so, we can unite with people who are different skin color, different background, because we're all going to be different dealing with that. Like, it's not mm-hmm. just white, white people, for instance. We all have to deal with diversity and things like that. It's like, you know, we have to, they have to, they say immigrants should Im- integrate into society, and they should, but they also have to integrate. People who live here already have to integrate to a world which is not going to be, mm-hmm. they have to integrate to the future, basically, integrate to the way the world is, it's going to be. So I don't, uh, I'm skeptical of, like, I don't think we should have this very standoffish racial relationship with anybody, uh, including other minorities, or you know, they should have with each other. We should try to work together to build a shared identity, be constructive, try to see the good in each other, because we're going to have to live together. And the alternative is we're going to have these Christchurch shooter type guys, you know, on all sides, to be honest. It's going to be like a war. It's not going to be a good thing. I think we can avoid that as long as society stays growing and prosperous and positive and optimistic. It should be okay. But I do think, you know, we should think about that. Think about ourselves as citizens and as shared citizens of a shared civic identity, which we're building together regardless of race. And in doing so, if we have that approach and identity, uh, we don't have to have the conflict over this. People don't feel that they're being replaced. It's not a great replacement happening. We're, it's like we're adding, we're not adding to society. We're not replacing anybody. We're adding to hmm. the human society. We're doing a lot of good. And we're, immigrants are a net positive. Absolutely. I would say that even as someone who's not an immigrant, I would say they're a huge net positive society. And, you know, I think this issue is going to be a very prime, it's already become a very prime driver of, uh, mm-hmm. you know, conflicts in today. Well, so, you know, there was a time before where Italians were not considered white in America, Greeks mm-hmm. were not considered white, and the national identity shifted to accommodate that. And I'm not saying that we're all going to become white or quote-unquote white in America. No, but I think we can all be American. We can all be Canadian. We can all be citizens and respect each other. And if that's the case, there's no reason to be upset if there's more of one type of person than another. It's just we're, mm-hmm. all, we're all the same. That should be the goal. And, you know, it's, uh, it's it's quite fascinating because when you look at um, the statistics about the future of America, they state that um, I forgot I forgot the year, uh, but they said that 40 percent uh, that by a specific year, 40 percent of Americans will actually be identified as uh, as white, um, yeah. like like non-Hispanic white. Um, and it, it, it's, it's a beautiful point that you brought up that countries such as America were, you know, were immigrant countries. Right. I mean, you know, many people fled from places in Europe to America for a better future. And with the emergence of the Cold War with Russia, the U.S. really took the the most brilliant of minds throughout the world, including the Muslim world, and brought them here. And I think that's actually what that that is, as many people have pointed out, the reason why 
for instance, the Muslim community is so successful here. And, yeah. you know, there, there, there's a really book, a really good book called The Triple Package, um, which mm. was written by these uh, Harvard professors in which they looked at um, the most uh, successful minor uh, minorities in the U.S. And one of the minorities that they actually put there is actually the Pakistani community. Right, right, right. And they said that the Pakistani community in the U.S., um, in its pursuit of, they, they identified three reasons that make a religious community successful. Um, I can't remember all of them, but one of them was that there was this idea that uh, we need to prove something to the world. Mm. Like here we are, we are Pakistani people in the U and I'm just using Pakistani as one of the examples in the book, yeah. but the, here we are, here we are as Pakistanis in the U S and you know, people are looking at us and we need to put a good image for ourselves. And so mm. we need to work hard. So that was one of the reasons. The second reason is um, they felt that uh, if we if if we weren't successful, um, then you know uh, bad things would happen to us. Bad things will come upon our community. We'll have a bad perception of who we are. But the third thing, which I think was most fascinating, and I think this will relate to a lot of Daisies, is that is this idea of delayed gratification. Mm. And uh, this was what they felt was the hallmark of a successful religious com uh, community is the idea of being uh, of delaying gratification. And so, for instance, one of the things that uh, Pakistanis are overrepresented in the U.S. are as doctors. Mm. Right. And, uh, mm. and you, know, you go to Boston and like, you know, a large number of the, of the of the doctors in Boston are Pakistani. But because there's this notion that we need to keep working for many years onwards in order to be successful. And we play the long game and not the short game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. right. It takes a long time to become a doctor. Exactly. It's a great, mm -hmm. great example. Uh, you know, I'm, I look at the book. looks like a very good book, actually. I'm going to take a look at that. But yeah, it's absolutely true. And look, like, you know, there's two aspects of it. Like, in Canada, there's a very selective immigration system. Like, they very ruthlessly cream off, like, the elites of other countries. Not elites necessarily economically, although sometimes, but more educated people. People they think will, you know, are already primed to do very well without much encouragement when they get here. But, you know, in the U.S. is a bit of that too. But also, when you immigrate, you have a comparison point. Like, you have a comparison point to your previous country mm -hmm. and your new country. And when you have the comparison point, you come to the United States, you can see that things are actually, like, a lot of opportunity. You can see the opportunities that people who grew up here um, may not see or they've kind of uh, been desensitized to. And it motivates you to do well. And likewise, you know, if you're not going to do well, if you're Pakistani, your parents are going to beat you up or you're going to send you back home. <laughs> or, you know, you, you know what poverty, the implications of real poverty can be, you know, how horrible it can be. That's uh, so why I, I find like the most uh, money, like people say that people from South Asia are so spiritual and stuff like that. I find the most materialistic people in the world from South Asia uh, because they are very aware of the, you know, the consequences of, not having mm -hmm. resources to deploy and they that fear kind of motivates them and drives them to do very well mm -hmm. uh, in, many, in many cases not in every case but certainly in many cases like and you can see this with people who come here become doctors engineers and stuff like that uh very impressive you know I, I don't see a lot of like young you know native people of, like you say native or people who the older stock ancestry people in the country like there's some but like I don't, they're not all dying to become engineers or not all dying to become doctors like it's not the culture around that they have different interests different things they want to do they you know do really well in some things but you know these long-term very grueling uh delayed gratification professions tend to be dominated by immigrants they do tend to be dominated by immigrants and there's a reason for that uh i think the one big exception probably the jewish community because they have like a different sort of mentality but you know if you took those people away what would happen i'll give you an example also in the Ottoman empire their minorities did a lot of the work. Minorities actually did a lot of the, you know, Armenians and Greeks, like they did Jews, they did a lot of the work in terms of like growing the economy or high level skills and things like that. And it would, with the sudden, sudden deprivation of them, which is a very difficult uh, situation for, for Turkey, like the wars and ethnic cleansing took place. So, you know, they had to really learn, relearn from scratch how to do everything. As a speech at the Turk gave, we said, you have to learn to do stuff now. Like, you have to be Turks, you have to do things. You can't just be riding around your horses and like letting the others do things. They get to learn to work now. And they did. But the thing that required that was like almost a complete destruction of Turkish society by the Western powers and uh, the big uh, attempted partition of Turkey. 10% of the population died, that's something like that. That's not going to happen in America. Like, it's not going to be cultural tra trauma that forces Americans to do 
relearn the skills that they've forgotten or is it relearn the cultural values they've forgotten or the delayed gratification that happens. We have immigrants, they have immigrants to do it. But, uh, you know, without that, like, you know, society would not function. So I think we need people, you know, also Pakistanis who live here, who come here for to take an example and they come as doctors and things like that. So guarantee that those values are going to continue. They're going to mm-hmm. be the same way that, you know, English people or Italians, they kind of got used to living here. They got, say, decadent. They got, they want comfort. They wanted to move up Maslow's hierarchy, hierarchy of needs. They wanted more instant, instant gratification, perhaps, after mm-hmm. a generation or two. They integrate. So then we're going to need other people. We're going to need people from Niger. We're going to need people from uh, Sudan, people from places, countries who are still very young and have a lot of excess ambitious people who will come and then they'll be the next generation to take make sacrifices to build the country. You know, one thing that I always repost or say to these people who are kind of have this more kind of, you could say, racially exclusivist view of society is that they often say that, well, you know, this country's ours because our ancestors built this country. And they're saying that, well, okay, labor is effectively a source of uh, political legitimacy in the country. You know what? I completely agree with that because if you look at society today, who's doing all the labor? Who's doing most of the labor? It's being done by immigrants from Mexico and Asia and Africa and other places. Mm-hmm. So those people, by their labor and by the labor of their parents, they are creating political legitimacy for themselves here. And they're becoming as American as anybody else here uh, should they choose to embrace that identity, which I think they should. So, you know, it's not going to, Pakistani is going to, not, nothing is super Pakistani gene about Pakistanis that make it like this. Is a cultural set of circumstances and immigration which generate mm-hmm. that. And it will be generated in other people in future years too, as long as we keep accepting immigrants, which that could be lost. Mm-hmm. But, you know, <laughs> it's, it's interesting that you mentioned uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs um, because, you know, for the first, gener- for the first generation of, uh, of immigrants that come, the only thing really on their mind is economics. Yeah. They're not really thinking about how do we integrate into society. They're not thinking about, um, you know, what are the different policies, what are the different political parties we want to support. They're solely thinking about their finances because, like you mentioned, many of them, if not most of them, are coming from countries where they weren't financially secure. And mm. so you have the father who now, you know, he try, you know, the father, you know, many people, including my father, you know, they begin as taxi drivers, no, no, right? No. Hey, they, they started, you know, they say in New York, two, two, uh, there's two million taxi drivers and almost all of them are, are, are Muslim, <laughs> right? right, right, right? right. So the, the first generation that comes is always focused on solely making money. And then when it comes to the second and third generation, that's where, as you mentioned, they move up that hierarchy and they're thinking of how do we integrate into society, right? right. You know, the first generation of Americans that came here, none of them were in the movie industry. Right, right. But now you have, you know, we're in the second and third generation. Now you have Rami, who has his own TV show. You have Miss right, Marvel. Right, right, you have right, right. Mo Amir with his own show. And so now the now the project of of um uh, uh the the project of uh, of integrating into society is happening. And now you're beginning to see, you know, us engaging with the culture because the immigrants yeah. they come in and they have their own culture with them, right? right. Uh, and you know, many of them right. are coming at an older age in their life. Right, right, right. Absolutely. So it's it, it's interesting to see now what our generation does now and how we integrate. And it seems like you know, you know, and the U.S. is you know with, with all its problems, you know, and it it, it sure has a lot. It, you know, we really have to be grateful for for this country and the things that it's done for us, largely. Look, told my dad was also worked at convenience store. He worked at convenience store so that his his son could sit on podcast and talk about. <laughs> High philosophical issues uh, <laughs> for a living, you know, it was not, it was kind of, you know, that's exactly a very similar dynamic. So, yeah, I mean, look, like, you know, when I was growing up, there was no like thing like Rami, there was no representation of Muslim people in culture. And you felt excluded, you felt excluded, and mm-hmm. you felt like you didn't fit in, and you felt that, uh, you know, it was the only representation was terrorism. I was like, <laughs> 24 was a representation. And but thus, I realize it's very important to have that. It's like it seems like people say, well, it's just about symbolism. It's just you know superficial. No, it matters. It's like human beings. It's actually human beings understand the world through a social imaginary, and we create a social imaginary by creating cultural products. And cultural products which represent us make us part of the social imaginary, which is what we need for young people, especially next generation. So it's very good. And you know, like this is the thing. Like there are a lot of problems in the United States. There are very deep problems. Uh, and, and not everyone's experience in the United States is the same. If you're 
African American. You have a very different perception of American history and the trajectory of it, uh, undoubtedly. Uh, or Native American, 100%. It's a different experience. But, you know, for immigrants, the, the reason they feel good about it is this. There's really strong reasons why they feel good about it because they come from places which are, frankly, a lot worse. Like, they really come from places, they're leaving for a reason, in the nice case. They're mm-hmm. leaving because uh, it's unbearable where they are, or there's no opportunity where they are, or the, there's no possibility of advancement where they are. You come here and, you know, there are risks, there are challenges, there are dangers. A lot of people come here, they don't make it. It's very true, too. Uh, a lot of people come here, they get exploited. Also true. But a lot of people see enough opportunity that it's worthwhile and that they are a lot of success stories. And that's the thing which about America, which is very inspiring and very positive. And I will say that I've traveled a lot in Europe and, you know, I've done stories about Muslims in Europe for very different reasons. And they tell me all they love America. Like, they don't love the politics of America, per se, or the foreign policy of America. They love the culture of America. They love going to America. They love the way that in America, I can come here and be treated as an American and like be seen as American, not be seen as a weirdo who should be like celebrating Pakistan Day, even if he's been there for like three generations, because that's like who you are and you're a guest. Uh, no, they're very jealous of that, to be honest with you. We have something very important and mm-hmm. powerful, which does not exist in most places in the world. Not even just uh, picking on Europe, like, Asian countries are pretty xenophobic. A lot of South Africa is pretty xenophobic against immigrants. Mm-hmm. It's not just places like this. But, you know, it's very special. It's a very special thing. And we should build it, preserve it, take pride in it, uh, because it's kind of it's all we have, to be honest with you. It's all we have to build on. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And, you know, so just, just tying this all in back together, you know, with, um, for me, the reason why this is such an important topic as um, as somebody who now has, left his native country um you know like uh, i'm no longer in canada now you know the options are open to me knowing that you know with the rise of the world with all these conflicts going on i mean you as a journalist as well um it's kind of looking with because because now with a lot of these jobs they can be done remotely Mm. like the amount of jobs now that could be done remotely um you know i would argue is are, are quite high um so the question now is where would where is one, where is the place that one would like to settle? And with all these different options, with all these different things going on in the world, one really has to really, you know, make the, make their decision as to what they feel is the best place. And so, I think looking at you know, like we mentioned, the future is Asian, um, and but the, you know we've put a little asterisk there um, and showing that you know it's certain Asian countries and these are other variables which need to be kept in mind, but. Um, overwhelmingly, you know, as uh, you know, there was this there was this one quote that this uh, Pakistani minister made um, when he was asked, "Why don't you receive funding from the U.S. or Europe or all of that?" And he said, "Well, China's the only game in town, um, mm. and we're gonna we need to play a game anyway." So um, China, you know, just 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 in closing, and I'll give you the the last word. China, in my estimation, China seems to be a global power that is beginning to emerge. And there is a, a very high possibility that Beijing could become the new Washington. But looking at all the variables, you know, you know, as you know, you know, you know, I, I did my undergraduate degree in history and they always tell us like, you know, history, you can study it and you can, you know, you can analyze things that cause civilizations to rise and fall and certain symptoms that are there, as we mentioned in this podcast, but in terms of predicting the future, that's uh, that that belongs to God alone, um, mm, yeah. and so we can we can we can posit that China is the future and Asia is the future, which it seems to be. But you know, at the end of the day, we just we just say Allahu Alam, God knows best. I completely, agree. no one really knows. I think there's reasons to believe that uh, Asia will certainly ascend in the, and I don't think we're ever. I think it's unlikely we're going to ever go back to the world where the West was so dominant as it was in the last two centuries. I think that. Even with very extreme climate change, I would be surprised if the world goes back to what it was in the 1950s. I don't think it's mm-hmm. unlikely. Um, but, you know, there are a lot of uncertainties. We don't know. Uh, but we can only understand history. It can only be understood backwards. You can't understand it forwards. No one knows what's going to happen. Uh, but I think it will be a very interesting time. It will be a very interesting time to be an American, a very interesting time to be Asian, a very interesting time, interesting time to watch what happens in the next decade or so. And, you know, to tie it back to the theme of the show uh, about, we talked about many different things, but about China 
and the U.S. I think that this is going to be this, the decade. If there's going to be a conflict between China and the U.S., it's going to be this decade. This is going to be a decade that's going to happen. And if there's not going to be a conflict, if this, if this happens this decade, then I think they'll sort out their differences and uh, move into separate spheres. And maybe China won't be as important as it is today uh, for various reasons. But this is a make or break decade, I would say. And you can watch Taiwan and you can watch a U.S.-China relations to see uh, what happens. Uh, we're living. We'll live in very interesting times in the next uh, ten years or so. Mm -hmm. And COVID, I think, has really done a number um, because I think there's, you know, there, there there's been certain lectures which have been done at Harvard. Uh, I think Harvard Business School, um, the London School of Economics, 15, 20 years ago, talking about the rise of China and how China will pose not only as an economic but also as a political threat. But I think with the with the focus on Russia. You know, they yeah. kind of just, they kind of, you know, they forgot to do a shoulder check and see China. Um, yeah. And so now they're kind of realizing, okay, there is this conflict and we're unsure how this is going to pan out. Because, I mean, China, you know, uh, we, we didn't get a chance to discuss this, but I think, uh, you know, when the whole Wheeler situation broke out and uh, the U.S. had gotten all these European countries on their side to condemning China for its uh, persecution of the Wheeler community, what was fascinating is China flipped the script and got all the Muslim countries and it got most of the African countries, basically everyone from besides Europe to propose the opposite. And so it really, in that moment, it really revealed to me how much influence China has on the world population, on places in Africa, on places in Asia, and that the global power, the global influence that the U S has um, might not be more than China. Um, globally yeah it's i was very disappointed to see that those countries signed on that that letter because uh you know i found that china is just basically bought people they bought elites in muslim countries uh to get them to sign on their prerogatives uh these countries are thinking short term about their fears of china and the benefits they expect to reap from chinese money i don't know i think that if they'd all banded together and said we're not going to sign this and here's our counter letter china would have had to uh recalculate because China is not a planet unto itself. They have mm -hmm. a very arrogant middle kingdom type attitude. The Chinese, diplomat. I've interviewed some Chinese diplomats before. They're very arrogant uh, and not very effective. The ones I interviewed, to be honest with you. So, you know, this, uh, this, that letter was just a sign of the, you know, degradation and humiliation of Muslim countries in modern times. No ability to stand for themselves, no ability to take a moral stand, except against the U S because the U S is not gonna, it's willing to kind of allow quote unquote free speech, the Chinese are not. So, you know, that was a very depressing and uh, disappointing uh, episode. But, you know, I think it's it's very short term thinking. The Pakistan said China's the only game in town. The, the, Pakistan made China the only game in town by with their mismanagement of their relationships with other neighbors. Pakistan's at odds with all its neighbors, it's at odds with the West, it's at odds with everybody. Um, so in doing so, they've put themselves in a very strong position to become a Chinese economic colony. I don't think I think the rest of the world should balance their relationships, balance your relationship with Europe, with Africa, with America, uh, with Southeast Asia, balance around China. Uh, it's not no one should let China dictate them to them how the world should be or what they should do and so forth. And they should be able to speak with a moral authority towards China, too, when necessary. We're also having a good relationship when time calls for it. But yeah, that's my thoughts about that. Uh, hopefully you don't see any such letters like that in the future, although I'm not optimistic. But, but you know what, what I think was a larger problem about that letter, well, I don't know if I would say larger, but is that it really showed how polarized the world has become and mm. how what now if we witness the second Cold War, you see that the Muslim world is really, um, you know, is, is, you know is, is at the center of it. And what's fascinating about, well, what's disturbing about the first Cold War <clears throat> is um people don't really talk people talk about russia and the us but they don't really talk about you know many places in the muslim world which were affected by it and you know many people don't know that indonesia actually uh, uh indonesia had basically more than a million people killed in the cold war um in indonesia with the american uh support um uh of the tyrant uh, i believe it was soharto or sukarno but uh mm -hmm. and they went on this full uh purge of all people who they felt were communists the vast majority who weren't and so millions of people died and so 
seeing the parallels that happened in that Cold War, and now that the Muslim world is at the center of it today, um, you know, there's some fear that, you know, history may repeat itself. You know, I think it's possible, but I don't see it as likely today that China and the U.S. are going to have a Cold War the way that the U.S. and the Soviets had one in terms of fighting all of the planet for spheres of influence, because there's no ideological competition between China and the U.S. per se. Uh, the Soviet Union was a revolutionary power. It wanted to change the entire world, its own system. Uh, they had very strong ideology, and that ideology was attractive to a lot of people around the world who were willing to find their side. There's no Chinese ideology per se. Like technically, they're communists, but they're not really mm -hmm. communists. They're not like ideological communists. They're state yeah. capitalists. Yeah. Uh, so, and they don't have any desire to export their system. They don't care. You can have mm -hmm. any system you want. You can have cannibalism. You can have democracy. You can have whatever it is. Uh, they don't care as long as they get their economic benefits of the relationship with you. They're not interested in the world outside of China's borders. Even the Uyghur situation is because they define they're against Islam as expressed freely in China. They don't care what Saudi Arabia does. They have no interest in wiping out Islam in the Muslim world, for instance. They don't care. Uh, but, you know, that, that sense of conflict, that ideological conflict, was very strong between the U.S. and Soviet Union. So that led to these clashes everywhere. It led to a world which people felt divided between communism and capitalism. But there's not going to be, there's not a comparable clash at all between China and the U.S. There's going to be a clash of interests, economic interests, uh, political interests. That will happen. But I don't foresee a uh, global war the way the Cold War was. Mm -hmm. Hopefully. Hopefully. Yeah, hopefully. Hopefully. I could be wrong. I could be wrong. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I, I, don't, I don't foresee it. Don't foresee mm -hmm. it. Yeah. Hopefully. Um, so um, I think we've covered everything that we needed to cover. Um, if there's any last thoughts that you have, Mortaza, um, on any of the things we mentioned, uh, I'll let you have the final say. Th thank you so much for having me on. It was a pleasure to talk with you. I can come talk to you anytime. I can talk about stuff all day. Uh, but, you know, hopefully it's benefit for your listeners and viewers. And uh, looking forward to seeing future episodes and what other guests you have on. Thank you, Mortaza. It was definitely a delightful conversation. And for anybody who's new to the channel, uh, we'd like for you to subscribe and comment and let us know your thoughts. Do you think that Asia is going to be uh, the superpower in the future? Um, and maybe what are some of the variables that will cause for it to rise or decline? But uh, thank you so much, everybody, for tuning um, and take care. See you soon. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.